Scottish nationalists suffer a major setback. The UK Supreme Court blocks efforts to hold a second independence referendum, but is all hope lost for Scots wanting out of Westminster? Also on the program, another scandal in France's Catholic Church with hundreds of thousands of alleged victims of child sex abuse. Can the church rebuild its reputation as new cases emerge? I'm Andrea Sankey, and this is The Newsmakers. For 315 years, the nations of Scotland and England have been politically tied under the umbrella of the United Kingdom. But over the past decade, voices asking to end that relationship have grown louder. On Wednesday, though, they suffered a setback when the UK Supreme Court ruled that Scotland cannot hold a second independence referendum. A 2014 vote showed 55% of Scots wanted to remain in the UK. But the country's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, and her Scottish National Party argue that the UK's departure from the European Union, which a majority of Scottish voters opposed, has radically changed the political and economic landscape. Well, shortly after the ruling, thousands of people joined 14 protests across the country in support of Scotland's independence. But they were met by some rivals who backed the court's decision to keep the centuries-old union together. Sturgeon herself was at the protests where she said she would work within the law to make Scottish independence happen. That the United Kingdom is not a voluntary partnership of nations. Any partnership in any walk of life that requires one party to seek the consent of another to choose its own future is not voluntary. It is not a partnership at all. Meanwhile, in London, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was asked about the decision in the House of Commons. He welcomed the ruling. If the Prime Minister keeps blocking that referendum, will he at least be honest and confirm that the very idea that the United Kingdom is a voluntary union of nations is now dead and buried? Well, Mr Speaker, let me start by saying we respect the clear and definitive ruling of the, on the Supreme Court. Of the United Kingdom. And what I would say to the honourable gentleman that, uh, firstly, I am looking forward to also seeing uh, the moderator of Scotland tomorrow. Uh, and I think that the people of Scotland want us to be working on fixing the major challenges that we collectively face. So the decision to leave the United Kingdom will, for now, not be in the hands of the people. But that's not to say they won't continue championing the cause. Very, very disappointed. Um, we're really just going to have to keep on fighting on and um, make it clear that we get there in the end. We've been a member and going for independence since 1968, so we'll still be going on. No terribly surprised, because there are British interests at stake here, and Scotland's democratic interests will always be second to what's happening down in Westminster. You know, and that applies all, across all the Westminster parties. We will always be secondary to their interests. I wanted to come out and celebrate what's happened today. I think it's great. I think it's shown why we've got laws in this country. And I think all of Scotland is not the SNP. So what's next for the Scottish push for independence? Well, joining me now to debate that are from Glasgow, James Dornan. He is a member of the Scottish Parliament with the Scottish National Party. And from Baku is Sajad Karim, a former Conservative member of the European Parliament. He was also an executive member of the European Movement UK. Uh, thanks both so much for being with me. James, I'll start with you. This was a Supreme Court ruling, but uh, Nicola Sturgeon herself uh, said, actually, our next election will kind of be by default an independence referendum, whereby the Scottish people will tell us what they want, and we will find another way. So... This is not the end, is it? No, it's anything but the end. I mean, we always suspected that this was a likely outcome, but the important thing was to get legal clarity around it, and that's what happened yesterday. Obviously, what we have to do is we have to take the case to the people of Scotland, which we've been doing regularly. We'll continue to do it up till the next election. We will make that election about independence. Just like the Tories in, uh, in the run-up to 2016 and, and uh, Boris Johnson in 2019 made it about Brexit and stuff like that, this is exactly the same thing as we'll be doing. And at some stage, 
the Westminster government have to accept that they work under democracy and accept the will of the people of Scotland. At some stage, when do you think that stage could ever be? <laughs> <laughs> the sooner the better. We want it within the next year, next two years. But looking at the way that we've got a Westminster government here that prorogued Parliament illegally to make sure they got a bill through, that has been, we're seeing today accusations of the PPE money being used to fund Tory lords and ladies. It's just very concerning about the way democracy has been played out in London just now. So we will have to fight hard to make sure that the people of Scotland get their voices heard and that the Tory party particularly eh, remember what democracy is all about. Hmm. So, John, let me come to you. I mean, do you think the... I don't know, the SNP needs to just let this go. They had their referendum, they had their case before the Supreme Court. It's not working. What should happen now? Well, it's uh, interesting that uh, the SNP themselves have actually now framed their position as being a single issue party. And the fact of the matter is that uh, as we go into the next general election, uh, the people of the United Kingdom, and that of course includes the people of Scotland, will have a whole wide area of issues before them. Uh, many of them will be very concerned about the cost of living uh, crisis that we are facing in the United Kingdom at the moment. Uh, many will be concerned about uh, the future projections of the economy. Uh, we're very likely to be coming out of uh, a recession uh, as we go into the next general election. Uh, but of course, uh, alongside with that, this places a huge duty today on the British government uh, to ensure that it conducts itself in the coming months in a way that actually deals with the very real concerns that the people of Scotland have, but also the very legitimate arguments that the Scottish government have in relation to market access and Britain's relations with the European Union, mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. is going to be a core crux upon which the SNP uh, will be hanging their election campaign uh, in the next general election. So, Sajad, quickly, I mean, do you believe there is, in a sense, another kind of workaround here, a way to negotiate for more of what Scotland would want out of independence without Scotland formally declaring independence? Well, I think the sensible course of action, and this is something that uh, I believe the people of Scotland uh, will actually uh, seek to invest in, uh, is for the British government uh, to uh, undertake a pathway between now and the next general election that actually deals with their concerns. Uh, of course, the SNP are framing this in the way that they are, um, and they will go to the people of Scotland with those arguments. But the Conservative Party is a Conservative and Unionist Party. Uh, the Labour Party is a Unionist Party. Uh, the Liberal Democrats are a Unionist Party. So they will all be fighting a general election as a UK-wide multi-issue election. Okay. Uh, and I believe the people okay. of Scotland will actually see it in that way as well. James, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, uh, fellow guest suggests that we are a single issue party. You don't run a government on a single issue. You do not get re-elected three times on a single issue. We have run the, the, the country better than most other parts of the UK have been run in terms of the health service and education and other thing, eh, aspects of it. But the fact is that without the powers of an independent of independent country, we can't do the things that you're suggesting. I mean, if the Tory government was as reasonable as you've proven yourself to be today, then we wouldn't be in this situation. We would have had... A, what happened was that in 2014, as soon as the, uh, the referendum was over, we were told, that's you had your chance, go away and do as you're told. That's not how mature governments work. Started with Cameron and it's continued right through to now. Johnson and, and the, the two, three there's been in the last two months since Johnson chopped it, have, have just completely ignored Scotland. And the, the opposition, it's not just the Tories, the opposition have been every bit as bad. Mm. They only want Scotland when they can take something out of it. We're not an equal partner and yesterday that was proven in court. Okay, James, I mean, let me ask you then quickly, I mean, could you suggest 
another kind of workaround? Is there a way to negotiate whereby it's less confrontational? Westminster isn't telling you as you see them saying to the S&P, go back to your corner, be quiet now, uh, you lost. Where, where could there be some dialogue where Scotland could get what it wants without going as far as, as independence? Well, independence is the right of every country, surely. I mean, there's, there's hardly a country that the, the UK ever ruled that's, uh, that's still uh, controlled by it in any way. But the fact is that we had the Smith report after the referendum. And the Smith report gave us a way to start to work together. But since then, almost all of it's been ignored by the unionist parties. And there's been no spirit of cooperation at all. We send ministers down to uh, joint ministerial meetings, and, and not just Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and, and it's almost like they're treated like they're just there to listen and not to participate. And sometimes okay. the cabinet secretary or minister doesn't turn up for that. Okay. So, Judd, let me ask you, I mean, with the people in power right now in Westminster, Rishi, Sh Rishi Sunak uh, as prime minister, do you see this going forward potentially as more conciliatory? Will there at least be a change in tone? Or do you see the same kind of conflictual relationship growing even more? Well, I think it's important to realize that um, uh, the, the, the Scottish government uh, representing Scotland hasn't been a single issue party, a single issue government at all. And that's not an argument that I made. Uh, what I said very clearly was that the SNP as a political party has defined that they will go into the next general UK election, not Scottish election, general UK election as a single issue party campaigning yes. for uh, an independent referendum. So this is a very clear distinction. Now, uh, it's actually a very important question you've put to me uh, about the uh, way forward and attitude of this government. And conservatives like myself accept today there is a particular responsibility upon us. We believe in the union, and therefore we now today have to ensure that all parts of the union and the very legitimate concerns that they have in particular about, for instance, our relations with the European Union, and this is something that Scotland took a very different position to England on, but as a government of the United Kingdom, we have to incorporate Scottish concerns. Now, I will readily accept that um, over the last um, two prime ministers, uh, that that hasn't been the case. And that is part of the reason why uh, we find ourselves today in this particular position. Uh, I believe, I hope, and I have uh, seen some evidence to suggest that the current government uh, under Rishi Sunak's uh, leadership is going to take an attitude which is far more conciliatory, uh, not just in terms of the UK and reaching out to our immediate neighbours, but also internally within the UK as well. Okay. Sajad, Karim, that will have to be the final word. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this segment of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank you and James Dornan so much for being with me on the Newsmakers. Now, after decades of complaints of child sex abuse, the French Catholic Church continues facing an ever-growing crisis. Two weeks ago, the Vatican opened an investigation into French Cardinal Jean-Pierre Ricard. The clergyman admitted to sexually abusing a 14-year-old girl 35 years ago. French prosecutors have also opened an investigation, although the accusations are almost certainly past the statute of limitations. Then on November 10th, Archbishop Pierre Donelas of Rennes said, Father Yannick Poligné, a priest in his archdiocese, was indicted for aggravated rape of a minor and drug abuse. The latest cases bring the French bishops accused of sexual abuse to a total of 11. In response, France's 120 bishops wrote that they were aware that these revelations have a painful impact on the victims, especially those who have chosen to trust us. And it looks like these 11 cases could be just the tip of the iceberg. Last year, an independent investigation said French clergy had sexually abused more than a quarter of a million minors over the past 70 years, and that the Catholic Church had turned a blind eye. The introduction to the report is chilling. It reads as follows. The Catholic Church's immediate reaction was to protect itself as an institution 
and it has shown complete, even cruel, indifference to those who suffer. The report called for a humble acknowledgement of responsibility from the church authorities for the mistakes and crimes committed under its auspices. So what, if anything, will change now? And can the church rebuild its reputation? Well, joining me now to discuss that from Paris is Xavier Refruyer. He is the spokesperson of Catholic Voices in France. And in London is Keith Porteous Wood. He is the president of the National Secular Society UK. Thanks both so much for being with me. Uh, Xavier, you have said that the church has covered up abuse for decades, uh, which actually matches pretty similar behavior uh, in other archdioceses around the world. But do you think it's all reached a tipping point in France now, especially over the last few months? Must the church now honestly face up to the damage that's been done? Yes, obviously. Um, f first of all, uh, I would like to express the, the horror and the, the, the shame as a young French Catholic uh, that overwhelmed me this last year when revelations were made about all these uh, child abusers in the church. Biggest earthquake for a lot of people was last year with uh, this report uh, of um, a commission, the Sauvé Commission, may maybe you've heard about it, uh, who, who who helped us, helped us to see the scale, uh, to see that there were hundreds of thousands of victims in the church since the last uh, in the in the last seventy years, and f for me the the. Biggest uh, emotion was when uh, six people that I know, six friends, six persons, told me one by one at different times. Uh, they all told me that they had been abused in their childhood and that it affected their whole life. So uh, we are not here to care about the reputation of, of the church. Uh, as a Catholic, I don't want my church to look uh, shiny and clean, but to mm. be clean and to be real, really concerned by this huge crisis, by all these victims. People um, want them to care because they have shown, as it's been repeated, a lot of indifference at best to all these. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, Xavier, why do you think that is? Why was there just so much denial for so long when so many people inside and outside the institution knew what was happening? What did they think? they could continue hiding, and why? As, as we said before, I think the main reflex for years was to uh, protect the reputation of the church, uh, like, uh, just, just like if it was the, the main goal of the church, which is not the main goal of the church, is to serve Jesus Christ, and Jesus mm. Christ is always on the side of victims. I think that was the big mistake that a church made, um, but I think the, the the scale of the crisis was not um, uh, was not in the mind of uh, of people. We okay. Uh, I I think everyone was uh, amazed. It's, it's not the best word, sorry for my English, but was, but was amazed by these figures. And you may have heard of an operation that was carried out uh, three weeks ago by Catholics, uh, mostly lay people, but also clergymen, nuns, monks, and it was it was called. Sortons les poubelles. Uh, so uh, let's take out the take trash. Out the trash yeah. And uh, hundreds of people were holding signs uh, in front of um, how to say that a, a bishop offices. And mm. I was in Roma with my wife holding a sign on Saint Peter's Square, uh, which was written Sortons les poubelles pour une église sûre. Let's take out the trash for, for a safe church. We our duty as Catholic is first to bring justice to to all th these victims, and second, to make the church safe, to, to care about the future. So first, the past, and okay. then the, the future. Uh, let me uh, get to Keith, uh, because, I mean, do you think it's, it's possible now for the church to do that? Because it will have to win back a lot of trust, and there's still fear that there's still more to be revealed, even more oh, accusations there's, there's could a huge come amount out. more to come out. Mm. Uh, but the problem is, uh, this is a worldwide problem, and I do not know one country in the world that's doing this properly. Um, and the problem is now still. Um, I was uh, struck by the, the admission last week that uh, Bishop Sontier um, had covered up 
his resignation, pretending it was on health grounds last year, when in fact it was to do with abuse. And that's just very, very recently. When the survey report came out, uh, it, uh, it was immediately trashed by the uh, Institut Catholique de Paris, um, the Catholic hierarchy, to the point that the, the Pope ignored the, the, re the report uh, and cancelled the audience with uh, its author. Um, so it, this is happening on a huge scale now. Uh, and the report said uh, abuse continues at significant levels. Right. The, right. Another very, very recent event is the uh, the Archbishop Ventura, who was a nuncio and groped several men, including a young seminarian. Uh, he was criminally convicted. Um, so mm. he's ended up not having any kind of, of punishment, but the guy who had had the t uh, tenacity to report him was sacked. Okay. Now that just shows that the omata, which is allows the abuse to continue, is still in place. And mm. it's the biggest signal you could give to say, don't any of you dare to disclose. And, and that's just very recent. Right. So, uh, and the top Catholic in, in, in France until recently, Cardinal Barbara. So what better example could you have? He had uh, covered up the abuse um, of Puena, a scoutmaster, who had uh, abused between three and 4,000 kids. Right. Um, and he knew of three or four other uh, priests that had I'll abused. I'll tell you what, Keith. And he's got away with it. Yeah. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, Xavier, I want to come back to you on this because what, what is still fascinating to some is even after all these revelations and the proof that there were cover ups and, and criminal denial, uh, people still feel very attached to the church, no matter what the experience. And, and even French conservatives in government have been gaining popularity uh, because their base feels very connected to the Catholic church. I mean, tell us, does this scandal have any effect on A, that political support, and B, people like yourself who still want to be part of the Catholic church that they've grown, grown up with and loved for their lives? That's a very good question. Um, first, let me, uh, just a little correction to what was just said. Uh, the, the report made last year about abuses in France was in fact uh, pretty well accepted. The, the French bishops, uh, they had a meeting just one month after the, the report was published and the, they acknowledged publicly uh, that uh, first that the report was good and accurate and then the responsibility of the institution. You talk about you talked about Inst Institut Catholique de Paris. Uh, it's a small mistake. Institut Catholique de Paris is a university, and of, uh, that's right. A, a small group of people, uh, so-called Académie Catholique, uh, criticized this report, and they were listened in Roma. But in France, it's not. It's only eight people, and uh, there is no bishop among them. Mm. So to to get back to the question, um, but the papal audience was cancelled. And has not yes. been reinstated, and and, and Mr. I, Sauvé is not pursuing it you're, because you're of the in right. his words, because in his words, because it would embarrass the Catholic Church and the papacy. Okay, I'll tell uh, you what. We only have ninety seconds left, and and uh, Zarie, I do want to hear your your personal uh, response okay. to to the question. Go ahead. Um, I'm not in the church uh, because of a bishop of bec or because of a priest. I'm a, in the church because of my faith, mm. and of course. What happened uh, in the last years, not only uh, now that we know it happened, but for all these decades, what happened, of course, it's very hard as a Catholic, uh, but it doesn't change my faith. It, it changes only my uh, relationship with the institution. And I think my duty as a Catholic, and it's, uh, it's uh, the same thought for every Catholic, my duty is to cure it. We owe justice for the victims, we it's not time to flee the boat. Uh, it's time to cure it, really. And that's why I want to stay in the church, which is which has been the, the house of 
abusers because I want it to become a safe house for everyone that wants to enter it. And given what's happened, you believe it can be? It can become that? I think it can. As um, Mr. Uh, uh, sorry, as uh, Mr. Uh, Potterswood said, um, it, in Roma, it's hard. In Vatican, it's hard. A lot of people around the Pope are convincing him to keep uh, this culture of silence. I think it will take years to be cured at a global level. In France, we have a little advance, but just a little. We still have a lot of revelations and probably uh, a lot of facts that we still okay. don't know. But I think we are on the right way, and I want to be part of this way. Okay, Xavier Jacquier and Keith Porteous Wood, I'd like to thank you both so much for being with us on this edition of The Newsmakers. Greatly appreciated. And our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.